my I'm going to call this meeting of the City of Montpelier Development Review Board to order. It is April 5th, 2021. My name is Kate McCarthy and I serve as chair of the DRB. And I'm here with, with many others. I'll start by introducing the other members. Rob. Oh. Rob Goodwin. Kevin O'Connell is our vice chair. Kevin. Um, Michael Lazorchek. Hello. Good evening, Michael. And um, we are supported by zoning administrator, Meredith Crandall, who is here with us staffing the meeting. Hello. And in introducing our members, I'll next say hello to Abby White, DRB member. Hi, Abby. And then we are uh, recorded this evening by Orca Media uh, for folks playing along at home. Thank you for being here. All right. Um, the next step, next item in our agenda is our remote meeting procedures for which I turn it to Meredith. You're muted, Meredith. Give me one second. Um, <clears throat> design review committee meeting went to the just about the last minute, and I've got to open up my little document for anybody that's following at home. Yeah, and, and while you're doing that, I will preview a little bit um, what we are doing this evening, and I'll reiterate it later too. Um, for anyone who's watching, uh, we will not be reviewing any applications this evening, but we will be doing an exercise as a board to provide insight into the way for ourselves and for anyone who's watching to provide insight into the way the applications are reviewed and the types of things that are evaluated. Um, people who've watched our meetings can see some of that, but this will be to take a step further in um, so that we can understand how and just workshop a little together about how to look at applications. So, all right, Meredith's gonna give us our overview. Okay. So, all right, for anybody who is viewing this meeting via the Orca Media, um, you can participate in this board meeting um, via the Zoom platform. So to do that, you can use this link here and plug that into the browser. Um, and that'll bring you directly into the Zoom meeting waiting room and then I'll admit you. You can also call this phone number and plug in this meeting ID and then you'll be able to participate by phone if you want. Now, as, as Kate said, there um, are no actual applications for tonight. So there's, there's no public testimony. There's, there's nothing, no specific projects to comment on, but if you wanna call in and be part of the, the sort of mock review process, feel free to give a call. If you're trying to access the meeting and you're having problems, please email me here. Um, if anybody, um, I mean, we're, it's all board members right now, but if anybody is on per usual, if you're having problems, please use the chat function um, to chat with me about it. Um, even though we have no applications, this Zoom meeting is still being recorded and streamed live. Um, so I'm going to skip over some stuff. I think we'll, if we have any members of the public come in, then we'll go through the other, other items for them um, about muting your microphone. And then for anybody at home, if anybody is trying to get in and is emailing me and having problems, and for some reason they can't get in because it is a public meeting. If the public can't attend, then we'll have to continue it to a time and place certain. Um, I'll now hand this back over to Kate. I mean, I guess technically I still say all roll call, all votes will be taken by, by roll call because we have a couple of things for that. Good. Thank you, Meredith. All right, appreciate that overview. So um, the next item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda, which we will do by roll call. And I will take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Motion by Kevin. Okay. Second by Rob, any discussion? Okay, I'll call the roll. Kevin? Aye. Rob? Yes. Michael? Yes. Abby? Yes. And I also vote yes, and we've approved our agenda. Thank you. All right, um, the next item on the agenda is comments from the chair. Um, I have two comments. One, um, Roger Kranz has served on the DRB for 16 years on and off and has been a great presence. He has decided to not renew his term with the DRB, but I want to publicly and 
sincerely say thank you to Roger for being a part of this board. Um, I really enjoy serving with Roger. Um, I'm glad to know that I'll see him around town. Um, he's been a huge help to me as I've learned things and a good steady presence. So thank you, Roger, for being part of this board. We'd give you a round of applause if we were in a room that made some noise, but as it is, thank you. I just want to second that. He, he, Roger has been a great asset uh, through the years and uh, he'll be sorely missed. Thanks, Kevin. So that brings me to part two, which is there is an opening on the development review board for a regular spot, uh, someone who comes to each meeting as much as they can. And this is an excellent chance to get involved in the community. It's an excellent chance yes, to get a close up view of how people make decisions about investing in Montpelier, about how people work together to make projects that are compatible and advance our community's vision and about how we um, as, as residents can help each other by um, upholding our zoning bylaw with a fair and inclusive public process. So if any of those things are interesting to you and you'd like to support them, um, please do consider getting involved. And for information, you can either email Meredith or you can look on the city website. Um, there is a form that you fill out in order to get involved. Tell your friends. All right, those are the announcements from the chair. So next what we have is the meeting minutes of March 15th. Um, and I'm just going to peek and see, we have Rob, Michael, Abby, and myself eligible to vote. So uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes as printed from March 15th, 2021? So moved. Motion by Rob, second by Abby. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll call the roll of those eligible to vote um, to approve the minutes. Rob? Yes. Uh, Michael? Yes. Abby? Yes. And I vote yes. So we've approved the minutes. Thank you. All right. So um, with that, we are going to shift to our business of the evening, which is a training session. Um, and as I mentioned at the outset, and um, but I'll say again for the benefit of anyone tuning in, uh, this is something that we that I decided to do after talking with a couple of DRB members. It's a chance to just slow down and walk through an application without a decision on the line, but to understand how um, determinations are made about what type of review is undertaken, how we evaluate the compatibility of different uses in different parts of the city, depending on the zoning district and how we, how we think about steep slopes, how we think about natural resources. Um, these are all things that come up again and again. Um, and it seemed like the opportunity to workshop some of those together and just uh, take it slow and ask questions would, would serve us well as a group. So um, I'm gonna let Meredith give us a good orientation to what we're doing. Um, I think she had fun putting this together, so I don't wanna steal any thunder. Um, but my goal, if it works for the rest of you, is for this to be um, approximately a one hour exercise. Um, if we're really into it, we can keep going, but I think uh, that an hour is probably the right amount of time to spend on this. And is that compatible, Meredith, with what you envision? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's also, it's, you know, for the different parts, board members may want to just fly through them or pick different areas that they really want to focus on. I think that okay. makes a lot of sense. Okay, and recognizing that this, um, that because this is a training exercise, we may have prepared in a different way for this meeting than when there's an actual hearing. I would just ask that whenever possible, you put up pieces of the application for us and for the benefit of, of anyone who's watching. Yeah, it's, it's I think part of the, with the putting pieces up, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how much at home people get to see the individual things when I'm not talking, um, but we will do our best. Um, okay, take it away, Meredith. Um, so, you know, I provided sort of a staff overview of how I was thinking about this going, but how people want to lead off on it is, is up to you. Um, you know, I really tried to start this off with some just basic questions, the basic questions that as staff, um, Audra, Brown, and I look to when we're first looking at an application, these are the big picture questions that really come up all the time that you have to look through to figure out how you're going to deal with an application. Um, so it's really looking at, you know, your classification of the parcel, both with regard to zoning district and other big picture things like, is it in the design review? Is it historic? Um, those are first tier things that you really need to look at. 
um, then of course you need to go to the uses that somebody's asking to to put onto a parcel. Are they uses that even appear on the table of uses? Because sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's some completely undefined use and you have to take a look at that. Luckily, we don't have to do that with this mock one I pulled up. Um, but then you look at, you know, are they permitted? Are they conditional? Is it something that the DRB is going to have to really dig deep into? Um, you know, and then you start digging into the natural resources and slopes. What's present on the parcel? How is that going to impact the application? Um, I'm not going to go through everything, but you saw that at the beginning of my little overview. Um, I included some information here, like the, you know, the legal framework, the applicability. Um, it's something to keep in mind that there is a definition of development in the zoning regulations. If there is a project that comes before us and it doesn't fit into that development, it never hits the zoning regulations at all. Um, and we, as just an example, this is something that we recently changed the zoning regulations on. I had somebody come to me, what, six months ago, eight months ago, they wanted to just cut some trees and really huge trees. They were on steep slopes. I was like, oh, that's steep slopes. This is gonna, you know, this is, and it's gonna be on a, a commercial property. So that site plan. And then I went back to that development definition. Our old definition of development didn't include just cutting trees, even if it was on super, super steep slopes. Cause just cutting the trees doesn't necessarily mean you're disturbing the soil. And really in our development, if you aren't actually excavating it still wasn't going to be development. So we had to actually change the definition of development to make sure we're capturing places where somebody might even want to clear cut a steep slope. They could go in by hand and do it with a chainsaw, cut the whole thing down, and we would have never been able to do anything about it, um, which clearly was not the intended purpose when you dig down into what the steep slopes provision says. So that's sort of the, just when you're looking at, at, at projects ever, that's sort of the first bucket. Everything has to get in there before it can go into any of these other specific buckets. Um, so do we want to just start digging into the actual application here? Yeah, let's, let's start as though we're at the beginning of a hearing and you're giving us an overview of, of what has been brought before us and what the applicant is requesting. Okay. So, which of course is- So, so first I have a question real quick, uh, Meredith. Is this this is an actual uh, project from from a few years back? Am I correct? Yes. So this okay. is an actual project um, that went <laughs> before the board right after the 2018 adoption of right. Board. That that was my understanding. So just wanted to clarify that. Yep. So we've had you know we've there've been changes to the regulations since then, tweaks and adjustments. So the analysis isn't a hundred percent the same as it was when it first went before the board. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to sort of bring it back. Um, we've had, we have a lot of new members that never saw this application and it was a good sort of complex application that came before the board a few years ago. Right. Um, so in general, um, what we have here um, is a applicant who is proposing to build a 3,700 square foot um, as they describe it, timber framing shop. Um, and there's going to be an attached office swing in there that's a little over five, cl close to 600 square feet, right? And they're going to include a horseshoe driveway. So that has two access points. So that's something that the DRB has to approve. Um, and in addition to that enclosed area, there's also a staging area behind the shop for having materials that need to be um, worked on in the shop or that have already sort of kits of things that have already been built, but they're waiting to be shipped off to the location. Um, and the application also includes a 24 by 40 foot equipment shed. Um, so, you know, this is, it includes a conditional use. Um, I categorize, you know, I categorize this as light industry and that's how it was categorized when it came before the board the first time. I'm um, sorry, not late, late. Oh, what did I say in here? Um, light industry, I think is how it was an old, old, um, old use. 
So this is actually under our current regs. It's an ag enterprise light, or something, isn't it? No, no, it's light manufacturing. Hmm. Uh, what I wanted to throw out there is whether or not it fits under the ag, the the rural. Is it? Sorry, I threw it in here. I'm not as prepared because hey, I didn't do a whole. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there was a interesting one that we've never worked with before. Rural enterprise. Yeah, the rural enterprise. Yeah. That was sort of a question. I know that the board hasn't ever looked at the rural enterprise before, and I didn't know if it was something to talk about. Yeah. So let me let me read that um, because. You know, when, when an application comes in, it's typically the zoning administrator who makes a determination about what the use is, but um, there there may be different uses considered, or you may have an applicant who says, no, no, I think this is more of a, so a rural enterprise means a business that supports economically viable farm and forest lands in the city and region by adding value to local farm or forest products, direct marketing of local farm or forest products, engaging in agritourism or ag agro education, or offering goods or services needed for farming and forestry. So it does talk, it talks about value added products. So that could be wood processing. Um, I, I think that if rural enterprise had been a definition, it could very well have been that or light manufacturing. Is there wood from Vermont? Is that where their where their uh, harvest is from? I think that's something that we would need to dig down on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, here's the, the definition, the full definition, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, one of the things is offering goods or services needed for farming or forestry. That's not what we're doing. But yeah, the direct marketing of forest products. And then the question is, is that really what this is? I see that as an or. I see that as an elaboration on what a rural enterprise can be. Yeah, and that might that may be what it is. You know, is is bye. So here's your purpose statement. So what we're what you're looking at right now is special use standards. So there are certain uses that may be just different enough, no matter what zoning district they're in, where we have special standards for them. And so if there are rural enterprises they would need to adhere to the standards here that we're looking at. And this gets at Abby's question. Yep. And it, you know, retail, you have the sale or use of locally produced farm or forest products as a core element of the business. And that's, I'm not hundred percent sure. This is something that wasn't dug down into in the application before. So we don't have that information. So that's a question that I would be asking if this came before me now, or maybe I would put in the staff report that the, the staff, you know, that the, the board needs to ask, where's the wood coming from? Um, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily uh, it, local as defined by within just the state borders. I mean, it, it could easily be New York or New Hampshire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's actually defined. Local farm or forest products shall be interpreted to be within the state of Vermont. Huh. I, find that, I think that's very restrictive. It's, yeah. it's different than some. It's different than some state definitions of local, such as in farm to plate and others. Yep. yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a different. It's a different animal. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe that's something, but maybe that's also something for me to bring up with. I, you know, I, I, we, would, I would ask that you make a note of that, Meredith. Yeah, I will. Because I, my my guess is is that they're. You know that that I have some familiarity with that with that uh, business, and uh, my my, and this is this is just a guess on my part, but my guess is that uh, they're not they're not limited to just within Vermont borders. To get the kind of of product that they need, they they probably have to shop it around. Yeah, and then the question is: is this is that really does that limit this definition so much that? it's really a pointless category of use um or did did the planning commission really want this to be very yeah. restrictive to sort of in a small way small woodlots small farms that are local um or vermont specific and i don't know the answer to that i wasn't yeah. 
It, but but, but, it, but it's a good discussion point. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So now that we've looked at that, Meredith, do you think you would classify this as light manufacturing or rural enterprise? Um, I think, you know, like I said, rural enterprise is a question. We don't have enough information for that. I think it is still light manufacturing. Mm -hmm. I think that definition still makes sense here. Um, okay. Um, so if let instead we can decide it or or not, but if if this came up in a in a DRB hearing, if if you'd been working with the applicant, you would have resolved this by now, right? It's very unlikely that the DRB would have said, "Hey, have you considered rural enterprises?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's we. I would have at the very least, I would have spelled out for the board here are all the facts that go to these different uses, um, and. You know, if there are gray areas, the board would need to make a call on it, or at the very right. least, call it out for, for you know for for uses that you haven't looked at before, like for the rural enterprise. Mm -hmm. I've, I've done this before, I think, where there was a question of does this use apply, right. um, and if there's if there's a question of it, I leave it up to the board to make that ultimate okay. decision. Yeah, and folks may remember that we did that when there was a something about utilities and it had to do with, you know, whether whether something is hooked up to a wastewater system versus doing something that involves water that is not part of an overall system. So we made that determination. Okay. Well, does anyone have any questions about the way we do uses or I think that was just kind of a good exploration. All right. Well, uh, why don't you, is it, Meredith, do you want to say any more about the application or? <laughs> It's just kind of fun. It's sorry. This is I'm not used to processing it this way. It's um, different. Yeah. It's different. Um, so I don't think I have any other general stuff to talk about the application. I think it, if if everybody else is up for it, it sort of makes sense to just go through the process that I normally go through. Okay. If that works for you, um, which is very yeah. similar to when we go through a staff report. Let's do it. Um, okay. So um, I'm not going to be able to pull everything up because there's a couple of different documents, but. Um, we have our, you know, dimensional standards. That's always the next thing we go to. Um, and we've got to figure out, you know, does that primary structure meet all of those setbacks? Um, hold on. I'm trying to, I don't think I can pull up. I don't think the settings are, okay. If I do that, are you guys seeing the, um, meeting packet here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. I can't. trying to find which page has the dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I always look at this, clearly it meets the parcel size, which is two acre minimum. Clearly it meets the frontage. Um, the coverage here in this district, 20%, um, you know, this is something where I would actually look at the numbers. I'm not gonna go through that here. Um, but because they already had a permit to have the shared carport, the houses, this long driveway, right? They're adding another driveway. They're adding the, the shop here. I usually, just because I can't eyeball it, for a parcel this size where they're saying they, the max coverage is 20%, I usually crunch the numbers. Um, and same for the setbacks. Um, I'm trying to see they had I'm trying to figure out which one actually had the this is one of the fun things not everybody does all your good how large was the parcel um the parcel itself is 9.1 acres okay uh okay and so this one They've done, I try to encourage this. They put in their sides, their setback lines, right? So here's your 20 foot setback line and the side setback. That orange dotted line is the setbacks. Um, and they included their river setback from the top of bank. Um, these are just things that we, we try to encourage them to actually put on their site plans. It makes a big difference if you can do that with a colored line. You know, the septic pump station, that doesn't have to be outside of the, the back. Um, 
They've got, let's see what else they have in here. Um, so coverage includes all impervious surface, right? So you would be calculating the driveways and the parking areas and maybe even the storage areas, the covered um, timber pile. Yep, yeah, yeah, all of those things. I mean, when people start bringing in surfaces that are, it's questionable on whether or not they're going to be impervious or not, we start digging down into details. Mm -hmm. um, so with this for the, for the storage piles, you know, if this was coming before me, I'd be asking for details on what's underneath there, um, how long the storage piles are going to be there. Is there going to be an effort made to make sure it continues to retain grass coverage so that they move them around periodically? Um, or does it look like probably that's just going to end up being compacted earth? In which case, that's going to count as an impervious surface. Um, and you know, we've got, it, it, it gets, tends to get a little dicey if we end up with um, numbers that are really close when we estimate it, because we have some tools in the office we can use with GIS mapping and, and measuring where we can mark out areas. If it starts to get close, I tend to go to people and say, okay, I need a super defined site plan that is going to show me all the measurements of the driveways even here where it is arced, I'd be asking for that. Um, and then, you know, if they start getting really close, then I start saying, okay, we got to make some of this, this impervious surface pervious. So you need to start thinking about what you're putting underneath, what kind of driveway you're putting in and try and prove to me that you can get water to flow through it. Okay, good. Well, that gives some insight into how that happens. Um, how about we keep rolling? Um, Let's let's move past accessory structures in uses, um, unless there's something relevant there. Nope. And okay. Really, there's not because they've kept all their development outside of the um, riparian buffer, the water setback. Mm -hmm. We don't really need to talk about that either. That is something to always keep in mind, though. Um, as well as Let's before we talk about that, let, let's get oriented to what we're looking at because um, we've got a riparian setback and we also have a river corridor. And I believe those are different sets of standards within our zoning, right? Well, so the river corridor is we're looking at the zoning. So the river corridor is within the unified development regulations as part of the river hazard area subset. Um, so the board doesn't ever deal with that. That is a completely separate permit that goes through our um, certified floodplain manager. So that would be Audra Brown, who's also the zoning assistant. So we work these in, in tandem um, so that if a project for some reason needs to get modified because of those river hazard area regulations, we make sure that that has happened, if at all possible, before the application actually gets to the development review board. Okay, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just say that again because it's pretty important. Um, we look at riparian areas, areas directly adjacent to the river. There in the zoning, there is a separate permit that's all about river corridors. It's not and it. And a river corridor is the area that a river needs to move, it needs to meander in order to fulfill its processes over the course of hundreds of years. Um, and so it, it's much broader than we think of sometimes when we think of areas that flood necessarily, for example. So it's more about erosion hazard and, and meander. So, um, so I just wanna clarify that that's what we're looking at. Cause sometimes as a board, we'll look at that and we'll say, well, the river corridor is important. We wanna preserve that, but we don't have anything in our book that gives us authority to do that. So this question comes up sometimes of what is within our discretion and where do we exercise discretion? And I want to get into that a little bit about exercising discretion within the river corridor versus the riparian area and how, how we talk and think about that. Yeah, no, and that's that's a really, really good point. Um, especially because if you if you start really digging into the river hazard area regulations, you have the river corridor layer there is also a separate um, flood hazard area 
layer that's in closer to the river itself, which has to do with, um, well, it's not always in closer, it depends. <laughs> it depends on where you are and what the banks are like, all these sorts of things. The other thing, I mean, there, there's river corridor, which is about letting the river meander. There's the flood hazard areas, which is about making sure things are anchored down so that when it does flood, things aren't gonna get washed down the river or get destroyed. Um, there's there's a whole whole slew of, of requirements um, that I am personally not trained in, um, but it, it is a separate layer on top of everything else. Thank you. Pause there to see. Rob, did you look like- oh, yeah, just It seems like that there's a distinction there and that the river corridor is really more of flooding and erosion versus like natural resource and like aquatic protection. So really like looking at stuff near the river, it's, the board is really only looking at <laughs> more of the um, environmental or <laughs> concerns related to living things and not uh, necessarily the soil and um, flooding and that and that type of stuff. Um, not obviously not black and white, but uh, that seems to be the general rule of thumb there. That's I think a good distinction. Um, you know, some of the some of the requirements about making sure that there's a natural woody buffer along the edges of the river is in part to protect from erosion, but it's also to make sure that the river stays a living entity um, in those places where it can be. Good distinction. So, so the riparian area, which we see outlined by the it's the 50 foot river setback, right? And you're pointing it to, to it with the little hand there. Yep, so that's your, your beginning of your water setback. And the first half of that as measured from the river is the riparian buffer. So you have limits on what can happen within the water setback, the full water setback, and even more limitations within the first half of that, the riparian buffer. Okay. Um, this has come up in a couple of recent applications. Um, one out by the roundabout that was very close to the channelized, mostly channelized river, and then also um, further down on Elm Street with a subdivision. Um, so I just want to pause on this and see if anyone wants to talk any more about the riparian area regs. Uh, the way you just put it, Meredith, made a lot of sense that. You've got the water set back and the first half of it's the buffer, which is very limit. Uh, there are limits to what can happen within the full water setback, but even more limits to what can happen within the buffer, which makes sense because it's closer to the river. Um, uh, any questions about that? Well, I guess I think it, I think it, that we did uh, that application on the um, on Elm Street with related to the stream. Um, you know, I think there was some discussion about process for where the Conservation Commission has, you know, comment um, on things, often maybe involving the river. Um, maybe we could just kind of go over that process. Yeah, yeah. good idea. That'd be good. All right. So, you guys seen the regulations? We can see them on your screen, yes. Perfect. Um, so hold on one second, because I'm just trying to figure out where I see Conservation Commission. Um, so here is where the Conservation Commission can step in when we're talking about riparian areas and water setback areas. Um, it's specifically when an applicant is applying for a waiver to remove woody vegetation from part of the riparian, riparian buffer to allow for the development of water access and the development of water dependent uses. Um, and do, do, do. Yeah, so applicants have to submit waiver requests, any of those waiver requests to the Conservation Commission for written comments before the board reviews that request. So that's that's this area. When we're looking at Elm Street, it was a subdivision question. Yeah. 
Um, and subdivisions, there it's a little different. Um, there it is. Hold on one second. I gotta find the right place because I'm. I don't want to scroll around on my screen. So for that, for subdivision, applications for subdivision have to be for, for a proposed subdivision that includes natural resources area or their required buffers identified on the natural resources inventory map have to be reviewed to the Conservation Commission for review. So that, you know, and, and that step doesn't really say anything else about what what kind of recommendations they have to make or whether they have to make risk recommendations. Um, it just says that um, the Conservation Commission may make recommendations to on the application to the board. And the applicants are strongly encouraged to meet with the Conservation Commission prior to submitting an application for a subdivision. It doesn't say that they have to meet with them ahead of time. There's, there's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to make requirements in there. Um, and I think part of that, I'm not even sure. I'm not sure why that is so fuzzy. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, so that's the right, that's the right word for it. Yeah, I mean, is there any, is there any way that, we, I mean, like obviously you can clean it up in the regs, but is there any way the board can clean that up by, you know, you know, clarifying our process of how we, how we interpret that? We could do it by a precedent setting, you know, make make a decision and and saying we see this as you know setting a precedent, and it's not that's not casting it in concrete, but it's it's one way that we can exercise some discretion there. Yeah, I mean, it's also if you say we really we want you, you know, you're telling me that you really want these to actually applicants to go before the conservation commission. If you're going to say you're not going to accept an application for subdivision that hasn't had that process, then right, you know, I mean, you, you have the ability to tell me what a complete application is. Sure. If you say, I don't want to see an application for subdivision with a natural resource on it, unless the conservation commission has met with them, that's what I'm going to tell applicants. It's the same thing with, you know, what you want me to include with other large scale applications. If there's something that you find is missing um, in the application ahead of time that you keep repeatedly have to ask applicants for at hearing, you can give that guidance to me and say, we just don't even, we don't want you to calendar, calendar it until they get you that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think that's something we should, we should think about. So what, what I'm hearing is that there's there's kind of a, a may and a should um, as far as comments are concerned when it comes to subdivision. Yes. And then there are a couple places where <clears> the <throat> Conservation Commission is relied on by the DRB to make recommendations, for example, in that waiver provision that you showed us. Right. Well, it's a very specific reason. That waiver where it goes right. to the Conservation Commission, it's only for a very specific reason, not not there might be other reasons to ask for some sort of development in the water setback area and the Conservation Commission doesn't have to be right. reached and out. Then, then we sometimes have circumstances where the Conservation Commission will see something and will chime in. So in those circumstances, what is our, you know, so if I'm an applicant and I'm reading through the requirements and I expect that my materials will be reviewed by the DRB and then another plain devil's advocate here and then another city entity chimes in that I didn't expect to hear from. What is the Conservation Commission's general sort of role when it comes to weighing in on other resources not where it's not listed well, in the zoning because it can be very valuable. But well, I mean, right now the conservation commission is is advisory to the board, yep. it, and it's not it's not a uh, it's not a absolute standard, and 
I mean, I, I'm I'm a little uncomfortable with this because it's it, it's 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 kind of fuzzy. But on the other hand, until we have some experience, we don't know how fuzzy or lack of fuzz it, it actually is. <laughs> That's a, that that that's an official uh, uh, language. Shiny, shiny, prickly. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like right now the design review committee is an advisory committee. They right. are advisory on very specific scope of things, which is the des the design review standards. The conservation commission, under these regulations, has an advisory commit capacity for very specific items. Um, if they start to weigh in on things outside of that scope, I think that, you know, it's, it's still an advisory position because they are, uh, they're sort of the city's experts in a way, or at least some of them. Um, but I don't actually know how much weight it would, it would be required to be given if it's outside of the scope of the things that the zoning regulations specifically say, I'm going to just be honest there. I, I don't, I don't really know. So that's something we should think about what would be valuable to the DRB, because if we expect that we might seek conservation commission feedback on certain things that should be upfront in the regs, like there should be kind of a overall statement that says the, the DRB at its discretion may request consul uh, conservation commission input. Um, all applicants are encouraged to consult with the Conservation Commission on their project. Um, this is all us brainstorming right here. So for members of the DRB who may also be on the Conservation Commission or anyone watching, we're not presuming a new role without further discussion here. Yeah, we're that, brainstorming. because th that role could could potentially expand. Um, and that could be a lot to ask of a, of a volunteer. That, that's exactly that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, so our I projects aren't changing, but our regulations are. And right. we have to be careful about how we how we draft these. I'm I'm a real proponent of uh, if if things aren't absolutely clear right now, I don't necessarily feel a need for 100% clarity because we need to build up some some experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the other the, where I was kind of going with my previous comment is um, we would never want an applicant to be surprised by the conservation yes. commission Agreed. appearing at a meeting. Yep. with input that they hadn't been aware was forthcoming. So that would have to be the other piece of the communication. Yep. So um, Michael, you've been quiet and you can remain so if you wish, but um, I know we've talked before that we, we've acknowledged the Conservation Commission's capacity and coordination um, habits, um, but do you have anything you wanna add based on your experience? I wouldn't worry about the Conservation Commission as trying to expand their territory, if that's what you're worried about. And I think beyond that, if you're actually, you're going to have to provide guidance mm -hmm. because we don't have the focus or the capacity to be uh, as responsive mm -hmm. as you may or may not want the DRB being the, the may there. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the reality is we meet on different days on different weeks, mm -hmm. so we would be delaying potentially delaying permits or applications, which I don't think is appropriate, right? So we'd have to think about that. You know, that would be, I guess, a merit's concern to figure out how you would engage the commission. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I think the couple comments that came in from, you know, Paige and, and Alec, you know, I think it's just gonna be sort of random and it would come in as, as a previously, it's just a comment, right? Not expecting any sort of response from the DRB other than like, hey, think about this a little further. Yeah. But and I think is, it's just like you all are saying, I mean, if you're gonna, either if it's a want or a need from the Conservation Commission to the DRB, it's gonna have to be very clear beyond what the way the, the current zoning regs are, are written because we're just not gonna be able to wrap our head around it anytime soon to be efficient. Sure, sure. And that, that makes it efficient, like you said, and more fair to everybody involved. So, so let's keep chewing on that. I know that there have been times when the Conservation Commission or members of it have weighed in and helped me think differently about a project or helped me learn more about a natural resource. So making sure that um, everybody's sort of aware of when and how that will happen seems important.
And I think just one more thing, if I could just throw it in there, I would also be very wary of, uh, you know, Conservation Commission has a different agenda mm -hmm. than the DRB. The mm -hmm. DRB doesn't really have an agenda, right? The agenda is enforce the regulations are, are considered permits based on the regs, whereas the Conservation Commission is, I mean, it's in the, it's in the name, right? Conservation. So mm -hmm. the agenda is going to be different, which means you're going to have to provide guidance to rein it in. Sure. So that's what happens with the design review committee. For example, they have a checklist that we receive that frames their recommendations to us based on certain criteria. So, okay. Yeah. Well, this is good. We have about 25 minutes left. So unless there are just any final thoughts, I think we should, we should move to the next thing, but this is, this is constructive and I see Meredith taking notes. Yeah. It's good discussion. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Right. Instead of just going through piece at a time, since we're only at basically 3,005 to 3,006, what are there things that the board members want to jump to? I don't want to necessarily go through, you know, steep slopes, which don't apply here. You know, erosion control, stormwater, if nobody really has any questions about that, I'm not sure we need to, to go into that. Okay. Um, what do people want to talk about? Yeah, that's fine with me if you're um curious about why we have conditional uses and what those standards are and how they're different from site plan standards or just any of those sorts of questions um yeah i mean there's this this is an interesting one because it does have the big um u-shaped driveway but the board has talked about multiple access points a mm -hmm. few different times so that may not be a question here yeah you know, I think, yeah, conditional use and the major site plan are the big things that we don't necessarily go over in full, you know, in full detail every single time. Mm -hmm. I might propose that we look at conditional use because there's some overlap in theory with site plan and also because there's a character of the neighborhood question here that, um, that I think is important to explore a little because it's something we talked a lot about when this actual application came through. I think that sounds good, um, and because we are dealing with a situation here that you have different um, impacts, right? So mm -hmm. you're talking about adding in a a you know light manufacturing, but it's dealing with saws, it's dealing with um, you know with noise, potentially with a lot more lights in the in the area. Um, and those are all questions that, sorry, I'm trying to scroll to my conditional use in my um, regs at the same time. But those were questions. You have residences, you have residential uses across the street from the project, as well as across the river. Um, but the immediate neighbors are um, leaning more towards other sort of light industrial or um, non-conforming, but still some form of industrial or rural enterprise um, businesses, because there's the the sort of landscaping tree works place um, closer into Montpelier, and then on the other side you have the um, small motors repair location. And I'm just going to say something maybe obvious to people at this point, but we have permitted uses and conditional uses. Permitted uses can happen in the district. Conditional uses may happen in the district subject to additional standards to make sure it's compatible. Sorry, I dive into the details. Thank you. Um, all right, so this is your conditional use standards. Right? I'm assuming everybody can see that because I'm not getting my little green outline. Um, and so with the conditional use standards, we look at the capacity of community facilities and utilities, traffic impacts, character of the neighborhood, which I think is actually the, it might be the fun one to focus on um, because that also gets into our potential condition, um, conditions of approval. Um, and so, you know, your character, the current neighborhood character is, so it's the Wrightsville neighborhood, and it talks about it being a mix of open farmland in the valley, 
um, and wooded hillsides. So we're down in the open farmland valley in this space. Um, there has been some residential development along Elm Street and Gould Hill Road and proposed development should discourage fragmentation of this land by following conservation subdivision principles that would cluster development while protecting large tracts of open space for conservation, forestry, farming, and recreation uses. Um, e efforts should be made to locate any new residential development off quality farmland and out of the floodplain. Now, in this project, they've already done the residential development part. This is a new, um, new development. This is not residential. And people, you know, the architectural compat compatibility, I don't think was necessarily a big question. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think that the biggest question here was the character of the neighborhood with the use. Impacts of the use shall be consistent with the neighborhood, especially with respect to noise, hours of operation, and other features that define an area's character. And it says the existence of one conditional use in a neighborhood should not necessarily be interpreted as justification for a similar conditional use to be located in that area. Um, what right. I'm, Which what is I'm, why it's conditional use rather than permit. Right. And what I'm going to do, so I may have to change my orientation. I think they included a narrative about the, um, so these pictures were from a neighbor. These photographs were from a neighbor um, showing sort of the character. So this is the property to the north. So this would be taking a picture basically from almost the driveway of what's there now. Um, oops, things are upside down. Sorry about that. I don't know what orientation. So this is the view. So here's the driveway that got put in. And there is the, the property to the south. So this was all just a great big field, or is all under this. Um, sorry, they're all oriented weird. Right, so here's a ridge that's sort of behind um, and between where the development was going to happen and I think the river. Oh, facing south, yep. And there again, view south view of home site location and floodplain. Um, so it was an, it it was very very open to begin with. Um, I'm gonna try and find. Wow, that's a lot of pictures. Where's their narrative? Then, sorry, hold on. Okay, well while, while you're doing that, I want to remark that. Um, when we're talking about putting something in a open space where nothing has been before, the, it's easy to automatically think that a building in a field is not consistent with an empty field. But that gets us into a little bit of a catch-22 because we are reviewing the project for its compatibility with the area as a whole and the overall pattern of uses and pattern of land development. Um, and so when we are looking at something that's a conditional use, especially when there's not something, when something hasn't been there before, we have to kind of think in that way. Um, we may think, well, the, the what, what would be consistent with the area is nothing, but that's not our job. Um, mm -hmm and I think can kind of challenge when it comes to this more subjective uh, characteristics that we need to think about. The other thing I'll note, and I can be corrected on this by Meredith if needed, uh, or anyone else who works in this, in this area, um, the standard that we're going for is that the applicant shall demonstrate that the proposed development shall not have an undue adverse effect on the character of the neighborhood. So sometimes things might have an adverse effect. There's a building where there wasn't one and you can't see something, for example. People might perceive that as an adverse effect, but then you have to ask, given the character of the neighborhood, given the purpose of the zoning district, given what's allowed, is that adverse effect undue or is it acceptable? So um, that's kind of what, that's what we're thinking about. 
Thank you for keeping your teacher hat on, Kate. Do we look at um, soils, like quality of the soils in this area? Um, so, you know, there's the, the item of keeping residential development outside of, what is it, the quality farmland? Yeah. Farmland, yeah. But so that that comes in when you're talking about the neighborhood and how the neighborhood has been defined and if there are specific developmental standards for certain neighborhoods. But there is nothing further in the regs to talk about soil type. Um, and because what we were talking about right now is not residential development, it's industrial, I'm not sure how or manufacturing i'm not sure that that would actually come into play in this particular application hmm. yeah because they're not they're not making that the regs don't have that same recommendation for a light industrial nope That's no. yeah it, it's very you know and it's a it's a character of the neighborhood basically criteria, it's not going to come into play unless you're looking back at to how a neighborhood is defined um, when it comes to the soil types and where you're putting the development. Um, I'm just taking a peek. So it's, yes, yeah, light manufacturing, which was then the category of industrial uses. I keep throwing it. Yes. Industrial. Sorry. It used to be under the, the 2011 rate, it was light industrial. Um, so for, you know, for testimony on this conditional um, use, it, it really came down to, in large part, the um, testimony at the hearing because, you know, this is what was provided for discussion about character of the neighborhood. It all went to architectural compatibility, yard, lot coverage, and landscaping. Um, you know, they, they didn't really give us a whole bunch on noise or lighting. You know, they, they, they told us what the lights were gonna be, but this was a big part of the hearing. It was, you know, our, it, are the is the neighbor's noise going to cause and you know is their noise going to be worse is it going to cause an impact is the lighting going to be an issue um ultimately in the decision um you know there were some some standards reviewed um it's you know i call this out in my little overview and it's something to look at under our current lighting regulations there's actually some limits that help come into play here about saying that if it's not just the exterior lights, but part of the outdoor lighting regulation actually also looks at interior lights mm -hmm. if they are going to be below the top of windows, mm -hmm. because those are going to shine out, especially if they're lights that are, and if they're the individual lamps, the individual bulbs are going to be brighter and emit more than 2000 lumens. Those have to be fully shielded even inside a building if they're gonna be lower than the top of windows. Um, so that's, it's, it's one of those details that I think sometimes people skim over in the lighting regulations. And when it comes to looking at the conditional use standards as well, is it's not just the outside, it's also the inside. Um, you know, are there any, are there any um, large, unusual, mechanical aspects to the project that are gonna add a different kind of noise um, that need to be drilled down on when talking about the, the potential adverse impacts and whether or not they're going to rise to the level of being undue adverse impacts. Meredith, I'm gonna pause right there and say, good evening, Joe, good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you too. Sorry, I'm late. That is all right. We are working through this um, sample application. We're doing it in workshop format, and we're just kind of talking through things of interest. We've talked about riparian areas and river corridors. We've talked about Conservation Commission review, uh, distinguishing between different types of uses. And now we're talking about conditional use review and specifically character of the neighborhood. So it's on page seven of the sort of draft staff 
summary that, that Meredith provided in our packets. So um, that's what we're doing. And we're, right. yeah, we're going to go just another 10 or 15 minutes, um, just in the interest of having a shorter meeting. And I mean, I think I could go on and on talking about this, but that's why I do what I do. But um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have some discipline. Um, so as we're talking about character of the neighborhood, um, what I'm remembering from this application is that there was concern that this would take away from the rural nature of the area. And then others said, well, it will enhance the rural nature of the area because a, a, a sawmill, something that uses a forest product is necess necessary to create the overall, the whole of the rural. Um, and so there was that kind of back and forth a little bit at the, at the hearing. And Kevin, were you at that hearing? Do I remember correct? That, do you remember? Sorry, my mind was elsewhere. What could you okay. tell me to um, sort of? I don't know if you were at this hearing for the real one, not the sample that we're doing now. But there was a bit yes. back. Yes, I was. Yeah. Yep. About whether whether this was sufficiently rural, um, okay. or, or yep. whether you know whether it should be allowable, and that reminds me of a question about conditional use in general, Meredith, which is. Is a conditional use always allowed so long as it can be adequately conditioned or can something that is a conditional use be rejected if there are no conditions that it can, that can fix? It, I mean, in my view, it's a subjective exercise to, to a degree. And so that could, that could have vary, varying outcomes depending on, on you know, what the project is and what the location is. So I don't think there's any cast in stone on that. Yeah. There's a hard and set rule. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that what it comes down to is that it's not a barred um, use, right, in that area. Right. But the board could layer on so many conditions to make it actually match the condition, the character of the area, that it's just not possible because. Right. To, to be able to have it not have an undue adverse impact might mean it's not feasible. It's a good, I mean, it, here's what I remember. I remember that this came across as being a really well thought out project and mm -hmm. it looked like it was just gonna be a good fit. And uh, so, I mean, it, it wasn't automatically granted a conditional use we had to go through that process to arrive at that mm -hmm. but uh but all the all the stars were aligned with that project yeah yeah and i mean there's a i'm sure that we could think of some sort of light manufacturing that would emit you know odors or the or, or well, so an asphalt way. an asphalt plant i mean yeah. you know I no, I don't that that would be heavy manufacturing i don't know if that's light manufacturing well, whatever <laughs> though i'm just saying just because you have one light manufacturing uh, uh, a project and application that that meets the subjective criteria doesn't mean that the next one is going to do is going to meet it as well. I mean, it's going to be evaluated on its uh, individual merits. Yeah, and, and See, location. And I, I I think Kate, I um, there's always a struggle between between the subjective criteria and the strict interpretation mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of the regs. So for this one, for example, um, if, if the proposal had been for 24 hour operation, seven days a week, that may have had an undue adverse effect in a way that six, 10 hours a day, six days a week might not have, or eight hours a day, six days a week, or 10 hours a day, five days a week. Yeah, I think, I think that's a fair, that's a fair um, characterization. Yeah. And that's why it come it, it becomes very important for the board to flesh those specifics out if they aren't in the application materials, um, because those findings of fact in a decision that need yeah. to also be reflected in the decision can then come back and become um, basically conditions on the approval, right? If suddenly right. the applicant is operating 12 hours a day, way into the night, or somebody's coming in and operating in the middle of the night or like 4 a.m. because they have a project that they have to do. And I said, no, you came to us for this conditional use approval and said you were gonna operate from X to Y. 
that's when the impacts you're having on your neighbors are okay. They've been considered to be to, to not be unduly adverse. Once you get outside of those realms, I can't say that that's the case. If you want to operate them, you got to go back to the DRB. Right. Uh, and then it, yes. it basically becomes a condition of the approval without being an explicit condition that mm -hmm. the board has put on the um, approval. Those conditions that we throw in at the end are things that were not elucidated in the application as this is the scope of what we're doing. Right, because the things that are in the application are the findings. That's what we know to be true about the application that's presented before us. And for those things that need to be done a certain way that might be a little different than what's proposed, we do the conditions. Right. Um, so for this one, for example, um, this type of project, one of us might ask, well, what, what do you anticipate in terms of um, large vehicles coming and going? each day like so maybe you'll have your staff coming and going and that's at set times generally at the beginning and end of the day what about truck traffic and then we would have a conversation about oh gosh that's very early or very late or that's within business hours or that's more at the end of the week than the beginning of the week and we can understand compatibility yeah um because i've sort of branched off into conditions on permits i want to just flag this i can't remember if i flagged this during the last meeting if not this is, if, if I did, this is just a reminder that certificates of compliance are not automatic anymore. So if there's a big project and the board really wants to make sure that it is done right before it stop, starts operating, the board needs to specifically say that a certificate of compliance has to be um, issued before the use commences. And how does that work? Do you go out and look at the site with your clipboard and your maps and you make sure that the roads yep. as wide as it should be and the parking spaces are the right size? And mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, um, that there's a whole form and I go with the decision um, and do check boxes. Um, I've, since I've been here, I've only had to do one of those um, because it stopped becoming automatic. And with the new adoption of regs in 2018, it was a retroactive application so that if the board didn't specifically require it in a previous decision, it no longer just automatically applied. Hmm. So for old permits that were in progress, you know, where the, the construction was happening when I came on mm -hmm. in 2018, we didn't do them anymore. Okay. We are getting toward the end of the one hour that I promised. Um, I've really appreciated this conversation. Um, are there any kind of outstanding issues that you have either, or questions that you have either about what we've, this, this mock application we've been discussing or types of questions you wanna flag for any future training exercises? Well, I think this has been very helpful just in, just in the sense that we're not under the gun. This is a, this is a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a sample, uh, not real. It gives us the ability to drill down in all sorts of different ways. Um, and I think it's been time well spent. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I agree. It's been it's been really helpful. I like I need to hear things again and again. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> even even with the, the amount of time I've been on on the board, it, it's good to to uh, to do this from time to time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, no project is the same, but uh, you know, right. it's, it's helpful. To, these are not easy issues. <laughs> they seem easy at the surface, but uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff behind them so thank you yeah are there any topic areas that um you have sort of lingering questions on that you'd like to study at another time whether it's steep slopes or noise or parking or circulation or drive-throughs or anything else well in all honesty, i think in all honesty the more i dig in uh, i i think that uh that the, and, and I think maybe this is this is known that there's there's work to be done on the planning commission to yes, you know, to really to really dig in and um, you know I'm I feel <laughs> okay saying this you know I, I think that that there was a lot of work that went into it um, and I think if during that process some of the Montpelier planning commission's uh, recommendations maybe didn't get incorporated in or the Montpelier planning staff didn't get incorporated into um, the final you know regulations. Um, not the fault of city council or not the fault of like maybe anyone in the city, but I think just the, how the, that process went. Um, and, um, 
I don't know. So I think that like every application and every time we dig in, we find more and more details that uh, maybe just don't really apply or fit to fit Montpelier very well. Um, and I think it's going to take a while to, to really flush those out. Um, but uh, I just, I want to fly my frustration with that <laughs> because yeah. I think that it, it's, it, you know, until those are fixed, it's the, it's the role of the board to really sort of like look at projects as like, this is, is this what's, what fits Montpelier <laughs> um, yeah, for I mean, an applicant? We're the backstop. I mean, that, that you know, until, until there's more clarity, that, that's a role that we really are, you know, have to play. Yeah. You know, I think if, if we come up with a list of like five or 10 of those things, and I'm sure we each have a, a version of that list in our heads, I think it could be possible to sit down to have a joint meeting with the planning commission. Um, and that might be more fruitful when we can do it in person. Yes, but we, I, we haven't done that in a very, very long time, not since I've been on. Um, and it, it could be, again, without a hearing in front, without an application in front of us, without a hearing of the, the standard hearing, just to, to, to kind of workshop it. I think that could be helpful. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, the other thing to remember is that, and this is it's sort of a big picture thing, is that the, the regs, the applications that come before the board are coming before the board because there are parts in the regulations that are supposed to be gray mm -hmm. or subjective. And if every application were easy and straightforward and there were clear lines, they would all be administrative. That's a good um, point. So good point. you are getting the difficult applications. We're approving lots of ones that aren't difficult, um, or at least they aren't difficult till the neighbor gets cranky. Um, so, you know, there's there's a lot. The, the, I mean, that's that's part of that's part of the issue and reason we have a development review board. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but when there are places, parts in the regulations that really just don't make sense, um, I try to take notes when that comes up. But it also doesn't hurt to shoot me an email to specify provisions. It's really easy for me to then take those, compile them, and forward them to Mike because he's the 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 arm of the planning commission that comes into this office. Um, and he's also had lots of experience with revising regulations, drafting regulations, um, drafting legislation, yeah. and, and figuring out, does is this something that we can tweak in the regulations or is this a bigger problem? Um, you know, is this something easier? Is it a, you know, a, a really hard haul to fix? Um, you know, we haven't, as a, as a group, worked with the planned unit development regulations in here since they got adopted. Yeah. Um, those are going to be interesting when we start trying to apply them. Yeah, we may want to do a work. I mean, I'm not going to give us all homework or anything, but when, when we're ready for another workshop like this, that might be a good topic. PUD. Yeah, the, P, the PUD would be a good one. Yeah. And I think, and, and how the PUD and the subdivision can interact because yes. uh, they don't necessarily have to, but sometimes both of those will apply and come before the board at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, All right. Shall we uh, bring it toward a close here? Did, did, were you able to finish your thought, Meredith? Sorry. Oh, I'm good. Okay. So um, thank you for that training. I, um, I found it very useful. Meredith, you um, prepared us and walked us through that very very helpfully so thank you very much for doing that yeah i want, I want to thank uh, thank meredith and and kate i want to thank you as well you, you really did a great job here and that was a joint that was a joint effort kate <laughs> right on right on thank all right much. so the next item of business on our agenda is other business our next meeting is may 3rd 2021 because we do not have applications ready to go for our next meeting so we expect the days will be lighter and the weather will be a little better. And I hope you'll make the most of your Monday evenings. Um, take a little bit of that time that you would have spent on the next meeting and tell your friends that there's an open spot on the DRB um, so that we can get more people involved. Uh, really. if, they, if they aren't interested in the DRB, we have two spots open on the design review committee and there is four available seats on the historic preservation commission. Um, we need people for all of those. Very good. 
Okay. Okay. Sure. I'm making a motion to adjourn. I will take <laughs> Is that a motion by Kevin? Second? <laughs> Second. Second by Abby. Um, I'll call the roll. Uh, Rob? Here. Abby? Yeah. Kevin? Yes. Michael? Yes. And Joe? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Um, we have unanimously passed a motion to adjourn, and our meeting is over. Thank you all very much. Have a great night.